Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, don't worry, Ken, you can borrow some of my time. Um, you know, what I worry about here is that um, I've um, listened to two wonderful speakers. Um, in um, Eva and um, Warwick, and there's nothing I disagree with. <laughs> do, do you have any <laughs> do you have any specific <coughs> observations on the the, the issues? Eva said that uh, there was no evidence, for instance, that income maintenance had made any difference to the welfare of the the um, Aboriginal societies in which or communities in which it had been imposed. Is that a view that you share? Yes. Um, you know, I work in a space where we um, we do research. <laughs> we constant constantly question what's happening. We um, analyse things, um, and um, you know, there's nothing I've been able to discover. Um, that, uh, in fact, would be clear justification, um, for example, of the um, Northern Territory intervention. Um, and we look at other um, areas where um, Indigenous organisations, communities who are doing things on their own behalf um, have their funding cut and you can actually measure um, the impact of that. The existing community organisations, particularly community councils who did, were doing municipal work, were isolated. And they lost their funding at all went to the shires and it had a huge disruption in um, you know, building good societies for in those areas, um, and many people opted out because they were marginalised. Uh, so that today, uh, in many of these shires, the remoter shires, um, you have massive non-elections. <laughs> people refuse to stand for election. Um, so you have whole wards that don't have representatives in the uh, in the shires and people get by somehow. I don't know. Um, but what, what, um, there are two things um, in reaction um, to Warwick and Eva that um, strike me. Um, one depresses me um, and that's um, about the othering. You know, and I think present estimates it says something like uh, 1.5 million people in the country would be considered um, as living in poverty. Um, that's not a very big number when you compare us to third world countries <laughs> um, or even fourth world where most of indigenous poverty is found. Um, so the other ring is you know, depressing uh, and to those who feel that they're branded as leaners, um, welcome to the world of othering. You know, we've had a lot of experience in this as Indigenous peoples, um, you know, over two centuries of it. Uh, in some parts of the world, well, over five centuries of it. Um, the second thing that uh, strikes me about uh, um, You know the whole emphasis on the market and how it's going to be the saviour. 
is that we really, and I think this comes out powerfully from what Eva said, we really um, need to question what we value. I don't think we're doing that. You know? we, we seem to, well, somebody else said this, but we sort of um, um, know the worth of everything but not the value of anything. <laughs> Um, and that's where I think lifters and learners and um, having a go, catch cries, fails us uh, because it doesn't allow us to sit back and pause and as a collective say, well, what do we really value here? Um, and the things we ought to be valuing are the things that um, we're ignoring, letting slip, and that's under undermining good society. And, in my view. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Sadly, I, I don't have that much to tell you except, you know, welcome to public policy. It, it's every, every policy area that you look at, the story is basically the same, where we have policy professionals who, who have great solutions to, to public policy problems um, and you know they know they can be implemented, and and the the avenues of of getting those policy proposals through to actual policy and legislation are, are so opaque that it rarely occurs. Now, you know, Gonski was a sort of rare uh, case in this in this sort of um, policy sphere because the Labor government did you know, uh, instigate this review and they did implement it pretty much. Not, not totally 100%, but, but they went a good way towards implementing it. Um, but it costs a lot of money and the coalition government came in and, and as I said in my talk, the people who currently hold the purse strings are the people with the power in our society and, and they have no incentive to create a very well-informed, strong democracy because it's the biggest threat to them. Um, and, and it's not that they would necessarily be going out of their way to make us all stupid or, or to destroy public education or, you know, though there are some who would like to do that. Um, but, but it's just that they don't have a strong incentive to do it. And so when it, when, when it comes to, you know, priorities, it's not going to make the grade. And another, another great example was the, um, that's sort of more in my line of expertise, was the Henry Tax Review. So we had a massive review of our whole taxation system by a team um, led by Ken Henry, who's very well respected on both sides of politics. Um, and they came up with a very comprehensive review of our taxation system. And you know, tax is much more important than, than many people give it credit for. It sort of contains within it all of economic policy. If all of those recommendations had been implemented, and I don't, certainly don't agree with every single one of them, but if all of them had been implemented, it would have transformed this country in, in, in very positive ways. I think there were 150 odd recommendations in the Henry Tax Review. The Labor Party seriously looked at four of them half implemented two of them, and there were two other kind of trivial things that they did implement. The rest were either ignored or outright rejected. And now we're about to have another tax review. So, un unfortunately, this is just a sign of the times in terms of, of evidence making its way through into public policy. Interestingly enough, the places where evidence does make its way into public policy are in areas that, that, that are below the public radar. So it does happen, and it's largely driven through the public service, and the public service will come up with ways to, to change policy, and if it's not in the newspapers, and if there are no big powerful interests that are negatively impacted by it, then these things do just sneak through into policy. So we do have policy progress, but in areas that get a lot of scrutiny, you know, you just get big vested interests coming in and, and putting their stamp on things. Eva, I wonder, did you want to come in on the education 
policy point? I think, or it's a bit overly pessimistic. I mean, I, I think Gonski is a mess because it was an agreement between federal and state governments and federal and state governments constantly managed to push things backwards and forwards. But I think there are some potentially good things in policy and I think the public service is much more mixed. I agree the people in power tend to not take the interests of the poor and the disadvantaged, but they, you can actually get things through. But the problem is that very often people don't understand how the public sector works and they don't understand how they can lobby on things. So you're going to have things like the NDIS, which worries me, because it's a market model. One of the problems with childcare is it's a market model. The idea is that if you've got the money, you go out and buy it and you will be powerful because you are a customer. Well, I don't know how many customers in the audience actually think that they're powerful when they go off to look for things which just aren't available, which they don't want. And I've got a terrible feeling. I mean, the education stuff is working to some degree. I've got a friend who's a principal of a high school and she'd had more money to deal with difficulties like kids from refugee backgrounds and so on because of the Gonski stuff, but that's in New South Wales. So it becomes an issue also about whether your state government is prepared to make way for the things that are happening as well. But I think there are some good potentials in the policy change area, but I think we need to be a lot better at actually working out how we do policy lobbying. A lot of people protest these days. I've got a serious problem. I suspect Warwick and I might disagree quite strongly on this in people who think that the object of how you change things is by protesting. Because I've got a long hit record of that, and you, re you change them not only by protesting, but by offering the alternatives. And at the moment, on the, if you like, want to call it the progressive side of politics, there's a remarkable lack of alternative policies, because we don't have the think tanks, we don't have the funded groups, we don't have the lobbyists. And the result is that people go and jump up and down and think somebody's going to fix it. But the only way it's going to fix it is if people like you and people like me and people like others that we might be talking to actually sit down and say this is the solution and we need to push it. So I think we can be optimistic about the fact that sometimes when you do, you do get changes, yes, it's really hard and I've just lost a lot of ground and stuff that I lobbied for in the childcare area, which is why I talked about it. But if you look at areas, it is possible to do so. You look at an area like income management, the reason I've raised it is because the welfare sector generally has ignored it. It's income, man uh, in, in, income management, not in, uh, which is specifically a particular program. But people are ignoring it because they think it only happens to indigenous people <coughs> or maybe people at the bottom of the heap. But it really is a noxious change to the entire basis of the welfare system. But where are the groups that are jumping up and down about it? Where are the groups that are jumping up and down about the fact that in a lot of the funding of community services these days, and I might be insulting some of the people in the audience, some of the major welfare agencies, the major church-based agencies, are taking over from small community groups because the government would rather fund large agencies because they have people that wear suits, look like them and talk like them. So in New South Wales, we've just lost a whole lot of women's refuges that way. And in other areas, I think the government is also doing that. But there's no voices objecting to that. I think if we're concerned about the Australia we want to live in, we have to be much more active about how we change things. And it involves more than doing things online and more than turning up with banners. It actually involves doing the hard work of saying these are the alternatives we want. Because until we get that up, it's actually quite hard to change things. Because the people who've got an interest in maintaining the status quo are much better at maintaining the status quo than we are in putting up alternatives. So I think I'd like to encourage people to say we need to think through how we fix this system, like the Gonski stuff, how we actually fix a lot of the things that go wrong, not just identifying what goes wrong, which is one of the problems the left has. They're very good winters, but not very good alternative providers. Thanks for that, Karen. Because um, <laughs> everyone's got a silver bullet solution, of course, that will fix everything, um, which is nonsense. There is no silver bullet solution. Can I just take your question sideways to a, a, a local issue, which was the City Council has been looking at the provision of hack services, home and community care, to, to elderly and infirm and dis disadvantaged and disabled citizens. And the Council's conversation was, if I bring it down to a nutshell, it's too expensive, we're losing too much money, we can't run this. We need to find another way. Huge outcry from the community, as you would expect. Massive outcry. Any solutions proffered? None. 
The solutions where council should suck it up. Now, leaving aside the fact that federal governments can create more money, and leaving aside that councils make decisions every day about whether they put a, a stop sign in or a, a tree on a nature strip or build a magnificent theatre in partnership with a secondary college, which is an outstanding decision. There, there is obviously other choices. And Eva Cox just referenced what normally happens when the, the provision of a community service is put out to tender. It will go to those organisations who have the capacity and teams of professional tender writers who will write a low cost tender and del deliver a highly marketed response and they will crunch the local people who deliver that service so that the service fits the budget. I don't know much about Hack, but what I do know is this, it's funded. It mightn't be funded entirely. So is there another way that this community, as a community, could think about creating some vehicle? Because when I look at all the NGOs I know, they all started generally in the same place, and they generally started around someone's kitchen table, Anne Lansbury, um, with a group of people saying, gee, this is a problem, someone should do something about this. And then there's usually an awkward moment of silence as the people around the table or at the bar or at the pub realise there is no one to do anything about this and all that's left is me and us <laughs> and me and us begin to start a conversation about what will we do about this thing. And we need to continue those conversations and then we need to move it from being a clicktivist to an activist and we need to then start to create local structures to deal with local problems. But as we create local structures to deal with local problems, we can begin to shape policy at a local, a state and hopefully a national level. If we look for national solutions to local problems, we will get interventions and we'll get more of them for other disadvantaged groups. So that would be my simple solution. It's not a silver bullet, there's no easy way. Who wants to take it on? Um, I think um, Evie's got the answer to your question. Um, it's a rather novel uh, suggestion that we should go and ask people what they want. <laughs> um, and you know, the, that example of uh, the West Australian government, government's um, um, desire to close down. Um, 237, I think, Indigenous communities with no plan as to what happens to those people once they close off the municipal services. Um, and they gravitate into the regional towns and centres. Um, and there's a massive shortage of housing in those places as well. Um, and what, what you have there, what, the example there is... Uh, uh, you know, what I call, within the other, uh, there are other others. <laughs> um, and, and they um, uh, are manipulated for, for politics and bad policy um, to demonise and justify government action. Um, when in fact, um, if you look at Indigenous Australia, most of it um, is doing pretty well. You know? And I gauge that from 10 years of working with the Indigenous Governance Awards and getting around the country and looking at Indigenous success that never hits the airwaves. It's never celebrated, it's never reinforced, it's never um, out there. What we get is um, a Premier of a state getting up in the state parliament and um, using isolated cases to justify um, the closure of all communities in, um, and some of the things you know that Colin Barnett met, said in the um, Western Australian Parliament are horrible things and they ought to be 
addressed. They're terrible things, particularly uh, sexual abuse of children. You know. um, but the way it's done is to paint everybody, even those successful communities, uh, as somehow um, deficient and uh, only white folks can fix this um, because we don't go and ask them how can we fix it, what can we do um, to help you out because we're, we're, we're lost the sense of a good society you know, to use um, Eva's um, term. Yeah, well, that's an area I've done quite a lot of work on. In fact, just picking up, and I mean, it's, I don't know whether uh, myths can see it, we produced a, a Journal of Indigenous Policy where we pointed out that there's a lot of evidence around about what works in Aboriginal communities, interestingly enough, produced by people like the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare that produced 15 criteria of what works, which starts with bottom-up, culturally appropriate, in consultation, etc etc taking time all of the things that we know work and what doesn't work is top down cut cookie cutter etc etc so that's available on the UTSC Umbama website and we know what works and I think what we're saying is that this stuff we, we know it works in indigenous communities because it comes from a very respectable authority and also comes very much from the community consultations as well and I think, you know, I mean, yes, I agree, evidence-based can be very limited, but, you know, speaking from a feminist viewpoint, it depends what you take as evidence. There's certain types of evidence that, that is, has limits. And if you look at the stuff I was looking, talking about with the income management stuff, what's very interesting is that this is an evaluation done by the University of New South Wales and a consortium that they headed up, which tried, because they get a lot of government uh, evaluations to be absolutely clear and fair. It was a government-sponsored evaluation, and even they could not find enough stuff that was that said clearly there's any merit. And they were looking at statistics, which I know have certain problems, but they were looking at official statistics and said none of the areas that have now had up to seven years of income management showed statistics which showed themselves as fairer and you know, a safer and or higher school attendance, all of them showed negative statistics. Now, I know that's a limited measure, and I know some of the people that got income management actually said they liked it because they felt safer with it. But then the point is that if that doesn't turn up in the overall statistics, there's also the factor, if you ask people questions, that they tend to say they like things because it's rude not to say they like things. And I think we've got to be careful when we talk about evidence-based type stuff because evidence, statistical evidence can be very rough and very difficult and very and doesn't always, in, you know, I'm a researcher, I teach research methods, or I did, that it doesn't always reflect what's going on. But to some degree, it gives you something which can be compared and can be used. And yes, you can use qualitative stuff and you can bring that in and try and bring it in. But sometimes when you're having passionate arguments with politicians and various other things, the only way that you're going to get somewhere is by using some of the cruder, hardline statistics. So it's, in a sense, the arguments are always about trying to negotiate, trying to push things up, trying to do things. There's not right ways and wrong ways in a very rigid sense about what you use. But what you've got to use to some degree are those things which carry a wider level of conviction. And yes, that can sometimes act against it. There's a lot of stuff in the Indigenous area which doesn't measure it. There's a lot of stuff where qualitative measures are better than quantitative measures. But when you're actually arguing with politicians, I hate to say it, I used to say to my students, if you know what the answer is, use quantitative measures. If you don't know what the answer is, you use qualitative stuff. Because the quant measures are the only thing very often that counts with politicians because they can actually understand percentages. <laughs> and it makes the arguments very difficult to, uh, to argue. They can ignore them as well when they don't want to hear them. But at least you've got some capacity to do that. And I just think you have to be flexible about how you actually do it. And that's why I think we need a whole lot more progressive stuff coming up which says this is the evidence and point out the fallacies with some types of evidence, point out the flaws with it, 
but don't reject it because it's the only thing we've got in any cases. The other argument I used to put to my students is politicians can make decisions without any evidence and constantly do. Lobbyists and advocates need the evidence because we don't have the power. So we've got to actually work out how we create that sort of balance. I think it's great to have brought up the environment um, at the end of this session. <clears throat> if I put a label on myself as an economist, it's as a, an ecological economist, which uh, does not mean that I, I discuss ecology as part of economics, but, but what it means is, is an acknowledgement that the economy is part of the ecology. And ultimately, ultimately, all wealth collapses down into the land. And, and you know the natural environment being part of that land, we we can't have an economy with a dysfunctional ecology, and and you know climate change is starting to wake a lot of people up to that. Um, but there are plenty of examples throughout history where uh, ecological collapse has um, brought about economic collapse, and. I take your point about ecosystem services. I feel very torn about this subject. It's a, it's a very big topic um, in academic circles. And the notion of putting dollar values on um, environmental services, I think is very fraught. And I think, I suspect Eva would agree with this, that it, it represents an overreach of economics. That I actually think we shouldn't be trying to put dollar values on you know, clean water and clean air, and because what that does is it gives it gives people with enormous wealth the capacity to to buy those things, to pollute those things. You know, you say it costs twenty three dollars a ton to put carbon dioxide into the air. Well, if, if what you're doing is profitable enough, then you can keep doing it. Um, I think instead we we should be bringing the conversation back to the question of, of what it is we actually value as a society, you know, which has also been raised today. What are our goals? What are our ambitions? What, what, what would we like a great society to look like? And we don't ask those questions, really, do we? We don't ask those questions. And if we did answer those questions and we said very clearly um, that we want a, a, a clean environment, we want to preserve biodiversity, uh, we want to preserve our wild places, um, and we want to prevent global warming. And then there are, um, you know, many, many options out there in terms of mechanisms for doing that. Economics just being one of them. You know, a price signal can be effective, but but regulation can, in other instances, be much more effective. So, we, you know, economics is just one tool. And I think the overreach of economics into ecosystem services, as they put it, is is dangerous territory. It remains for me to thank uh, our panel this afternoon. I think uh, you'll agree, those of you who have been here since last night, that uh, this uh, set of contributions from the panellists has been extraordinarily high and consistent quality. This afternoon, the, uh, this afternoon, the last session, they're, they're really going to be up against it to uh, match the, the standards we've had to this point. Very stimulating. Thank you. See you back next. Thank you.